Hello, welcome to RC Video Reviews. In today's video, we're gonna go through the Edge TX radio settings for the Radio Master Boxer. We're gonna be focused on the radio settings today, so I'm gonna press the system button, and that brings us to the very first page. This page is called a tools page, and I'll give you a little bit of information on how we populate this tool page in just a moment. But for now, this page basically consists of what are called Lua scripts. Lua scripts have the ability to do things like configure modules on your radio or inside your radio. In my case, I've got an Express LRS version of the Boxer. So if I wanna configure the Express LRS software in the radio, I could launch this Lua script called Express LRS, and that lets me take control of the Express LRS module that's inside my radio. In some Lua scripts, when you exit them by pressing the return button, it will bring you all the way back to the main menu if you don't let go quick enough. So that's no problem. Just hit the system button again, and you'll be right back to the tools page. You can see on the boxer, it came preloaded with some games, which are kind of novel, but not really useful, unless you're looking to kill some time at the field. The main thing to take away from the tools page is that it's populated with Lua scripts. Most of them are designed to let you configure the radio, but in some cases there's a little bit of fun and the developers put games on there as well so you can play games with your radio if you want to. And you can scroll through all of these scripts just by using the jog dial over here on the right. You can see as I get to the bottom, I've got another Lua script down here called TBS Agent Lite, and I've got another one called the Wizard Loader. All right, that's the tools page. Page two, and you can always tell what page you're on by looking over here, there's pagination information on the right-hand side. Number seven is how many pages there are, and this number two indicates what page we're on out of seven. So we're on page two of seven. The next screen is an SD card viewer or file browser or whatever you wanna call it. It's kinda like Windows Explorer or Finder on a Mac. So you can navigate the contents of your SD card. And one thing I'll do is just scroll down to my firmware folder and I'll click on that. And you can see in my firmware folder, I've got a couple of different binaries for the Boxer radio. These are all binaries that could be flashed and they're different versions of firmware that can work on the radio. A little pro tip, if you'd like to upgrade the bootloader on your radio, you can simply find one of these binaries from Edge TX, long press the jog dial, and there's an option to flash the bootloader. So I'll press the jog dial again, that flashes the bootloader, and that's it. It's that simple to update your bootloader. So if anyone ever gives you an instruction to make sure your bootloader is updated, that's how you do it. You can also view certain file types. So in this particular folder, there's a file called readme.txt. So if I long press the jog dial, that brings a little pop-up that allows me to view text, copy, rename, or delete. In this case, I'll hit view, and we can see the contents of that text file. And this is simply an instruction left over by the developer saying, you can put firmware files in this folder. If you wanna navigate back up to the root directory, you can go to this little double ellipsis inside the brackets. And when you press on that, that'll bring you back up to the root or main directory of your SD card. Before we leave the SD card browser, I mentioned earlier on the tools menu, I would show you how these things get added. And the way you do that is you go into the scripts folder down here at the bottom, you click on scripts and then tools. And any Lua script that's dropped in this folder, you can see I've got Express LRS V3. So it is the contents of the scripts and tools folder that determines what shows up on this tools menu. And again, that folder is right here. We go to scripts and then tools, and you can see a list of Lua scripts in here. I've got ELRS, Asteroids, Breakout. Those are all of the items that showed up on that tools menu. The next page is the radio setup itself, and this is where the meat of the radio settings actually take place. So we're on page three now, and you can see the first two fields are date and time. Those really control the date and timestamps of SD logging on the radio itself. That's all it's really used for on the radio. There's no other practical purpose that I'm aware of. If it's not accurate, it's no big deal, but if you want accuracy in your log files, make sure that's set correctly. Next up is the battery range, and this range determines the graphical boundaries on how the battery is represented on the main page. In my case, I'm using a Lion battery, and I'm okay discharging that down to three volts per cell. That means six volts, because there's two Lion batteries in series, so three plus three is six. And then at the peak, 
4.2 is my peak charge voltage, so 4.2 times 2 is 8.4, so I have a range of 6 to 8.4. And when we look at the main page, I'll back out to the main screen, you can see I've got this graphical representation showing me just shy of 50% at 7.1 volts, which is about right. So that range, that's the min and max voltage for the graphic representation of your charge state of the internal battery on the radio. Next up is the sound section, and there are a couple of different modes we can use. I have mine set on no key, and what that means is that I'll get alerts when there's an alarm or a special function, but the radio doesn't beep when I press the buttons. That's just the way I like it. If you want yours to beep, you simply press the jog dial, and you can set this value to all. And when you do that and click the jog dial again, then any movement of the jog wheel or pressing of any of the buttons will trigger a beep. You can also set this to alarm, which means it will only beep if you have a radio link warning or if you have a battery voltage problem. And then finally, you can turn it to quiet, which means it won't beep at all. The next field is the volume field, and this controls the master volume of the radio. So it changes the master volume of everything that we're about to configure. With one exception, if you set in global functions the ability to control the volume with a knob like I do, and I will show you that in just a moment, that kind of overrides this master value because you can use your knob to turn the radio up and down. But if you don't use a knob, then this master volume sets the master volume for all the features we're going to cover next. Beep volume sets the volume for alerts and alarms if you're using no key, and if you have it set to all, then it will set the alarm for all your key movements with your wheel or your buttons. So you can turn this up or down just to kind of set the relative volume based against the master volume. You can use the slider to make your beep volume very loud or very soft in relation to the master volume on the radio. The beep length determines how long that beep takes place. So if you like a really short, abrupt beep, you can set it to be low. If you want something a little higher, you can bring it up here. And the beeps now are much longer in duration as you incur a beep navigating around on the radio. I'm going to go ahead and turn those off now so they're not disturbing throughout the rest of the video. You also have the ability to set the pitch. Higher values make a higher pitch beep and lower values make a lower pitch beep. The wave volume slider allows you to control the volumes of sound files that reside on the SD card. Those sound files are normally triggered by some kind of special function or global function. In my case, I have my rate high and low alert set on a global function and assigned to a switch. So when I turn my high rates on, this is what I hear. High rate. High rate. And when I turn my low rates on, this is what I hear. Low rate. Low rate. I can turn that volume up, just the wave volume, up and down using this slider. So if I want my audio prompts to be really low but my beeps to be really high, I can set the wave volume down here and I can set the beep volume way up here. And that way whenever I get beeps, they'll be very loud, but my wave volume or my audio prompts are much lower. So there you go. There's high rates. So you can barely, I can barely hear it. You probably won't hear it on the video at all. BG volume refers to audio files that can be played in the background. So you actually have the ability to put audio music files on the radio and play them in the background while you're flying. So if you want to do that, you can control the volume of your background music using this slider. Next up is the Vario. In the Vario, you have the ability to set the volume, the pitch at zero. So if there's no change in your vertical speed, this is the frequency of the tone coming out of the radio. And when you have a maximum vertical speed change, this is the pitch of the sound coming out of your radio. And repeat zero just indicates how often the tone will be repeated when there is no change in your vertical speed. Next up is control over haptic feedback. So haptic refers to a little motor that vibrates inside the radio. And right now I have mine set to all, which means anytime I move my jog wheel or press a button, I get a little bit of haptic feedback. It's a sensory feedback, so I can feel the radio registering my movement. If you don't want that haptic feedback, you can either set it to no key, which means you'll get haptic for things like alarms and alerts, but you won't get them for moving the jog dial or pressing the button. You can also set it to alarm, just like the audio prompt, same rules, and you can set it to quiet, which means no haptic feedback at all. So if you don't want your radio vibrating while you're using it, you can just set it to quiet. You also have the ability, and it's impossible to demonstrate this on the video, but you have the ability to increase the length of the haptic feedback and the strength. So if you want a really powerful feedback, you can jack this one all the way to the right and then set this one all the way to the right. And then every time you move that wheel, boy, the radio really lets you have it. So that's a little bit too intrusive for my taste. I'm going to lower it down to something a little more reasonable. Contrast is a reference to the backlight brightness, so you can increase the contrast. If it's too high, you'll start to be able to see the pixels that light 
light up all these different characters on the screen. And if it's too low, you won't be able to see the screen very well at all. So that's the contrast turned all the way down. What I do is I bring it up to a level where I can just start to see those dots and I bring it down one or two clicks. And that seems to work pretty well for me. Under alarms, you can set a battery low alarm. Remember my 6.0 is the graphic meter, but I don't necessarily want to run down to 6.0. I might want to know a little bit ahead of then when I'm starting to get low on my battery, so maybe I can take a minute and charge it. You can set that alert here. So instead of using 6.0, which is what I consider to be a dead battery, I might set this alarm to be something like maybe 6.3 or 6.4. Do what makes you happy there, but just remember that this is the one that triggers the battery low alert and the value at the top top is what sets up the graphical range on the home screen. The inactivity alarm should be self-explanatory. That just means if you don't press any buttons or move any sticks in that 10 minute window, the radio will play an alert that says inactivity alarm. You can make that go away just by moving a stick or moving a button. I like to set mine fairly high because honestly, I don't normally leave my radio sitting idle if I'm not using it. I normally shut it off. So I set mine at 10 minutes. There's also an option to alert when memory is low. That's mainly a feature on these black and white screen radios. We really don't see that on color screens, but if for some reason you've got a complex Lua script open, for example, and you want to be alerted when you're being low on memory, you can go ahead and leave that checked. I would leave it checked. The next option under sound off is in the event you turn all of your audio prompts off and you have that checked, the radio will warn you, hey, you've got all your alarms turned off. Is that what you want? And you can say yes or no. So I think if you do turn all your alerts off, you probably can go ahead and turn that off as well. But if you want that safety feature so that you don't accidentally turn all your audio prompts off, go ahead and leave it on. But if you're one of the types that doesn't want any audio prompts, that would get annoying really quick. RSSI shutdown simply monitors the RSSI coming from your receiver. And if you still have RSSI and you try and turn your radio off, the radio will alert you and it'll say, hey, your receiver is still connected. Are you sure you want to shut down? It's probably a good idea to leave that one checked because you really don't want to turn your transmitter off while your receiver is still powered. Under backlight, there are a couple of different modes. I have mine set to off because I control my backlight with a pot up top. I'll show you how to do that in just a moment when we get to global functions, but that's why I leave mine off. If you don't want to use backlight on a potentiometer up top, if you don't want to burn a potentiometer for that, and you'd rather just have the radio control your backlight, you can do that here. So press on the jog dial and you can set it to keys, control, both, or on. And if you set it to keys, what that means is that only the keys will activate the backlight. So it's gonna time out because I have the timeout set for five seconds. There's the timeout. Now, if I move my stick, notice the backlight doesn't come back on. But if I move one of my keys or press a button, the backlight comes back on. So that's what keys means. Alternatively, you can say, I only want the backlight to come on when a control is moved. So in five seconds, this will time out. Now I can move my keys all I want. They don't bring the backlight back on, but the second I move a control, the backlight comes back into play. You can also set it to both, which means either the keys or the controls will bring it back on, or you can set it to on, which means the backlight just never goes off. The duration refers to how long it takes without touching anything before the backlight dims. Right now I've got it set at five seconds, which is fairly aggressive. And I have my mode set to both so I can bring it back either with a stick movement or a key movement. If I want that duration to be a little bit longer, say a minute, you can do that as well. Just set it for 60 seconds. Now it'll take a minute before that backlight goes dim. And then the last thing I'll show you is that this brightness value, if you don't have it set by a pot, this is the option that controls how bright the screen is. So you can set that here and that will give you the same effect as doing what I'm doing with my potentiometer up top. You can bring the brightness down or bring it back up. If you're not using some other method via global function to control your brightness, this is where you set the screen brightness on the radio setup. And then the last option under the backlight is alarm. If you put a check mark in there, anytime there's an alert on the radio, like your battery is low or you have a radio alert, that will also bring the backlight up to your specified level. The splash screen, I normally turn that off, but that's the boot up splash screen. So I'll turn it on and show you what it looks like. I'll just set it for say four seconds. We'll turn the radio off and then we'll turn the radio back on and you'll see the splash screen for four seconds. It says Edge TX, that's the splash screen. Personally, I have no use for that, so I always leave it off. And then power on delay and power off delay, I guess these are safety features to prevent you from just bumping the button and turning the radio on and off. So for example, if you want the power off delay to be set for two or three seconds, what that means is that you have to hold the power button down for three seconds before the radio shuts off. 
And you should see a little countdown timer showing you when the radio is about to go off. Personally, I don't ever make a mistake of turning the radio off accidentally, so I go ahead and leave that set to zero. The owner ID is a custom registration ID used for certain ISRM modules. If you don't know what it is and you don't need to use a specified owner ID, just leave it alone. The time zone only really matters if you actually have a GPS connected and you're getting clock data from the GPS. So you'd wanna set your time zone based on where you are. In my case, it should be minus five because I am minus five GMT. And then you can adjust your real time clock, which is your radio clock using GPS information. Again, if you have a GPS connected, if you don't, these two settings really don't matter. And then GPS coordinates, same deal. If you're getting GPS data, you might want to specify whether or not you want DMS or NMEA. The country code is used by some RF modules to ensure your radio complies with standards for the country that you're in. So in my case, I'm in the U S I set mine to U S. My voice language is set to English. There's a couple of other options you can choose. And there's an SD card structure with sounds that will automatically revert to audio prompts in the language you choose here. So in my case, voice language I use is English. And then under units, I prefer the Imperial method. Yes, we still use that in the US. One of two countries left, I think, that do it. Maybe three. The play delay refers to the amount of time that must pass before a middle switch play value is activated. So for example, if you have a three position switch and you have an audio track assigned to the high, the mid and the low, but you don't want the mid to play when you're going from say high to low, that's what that delay is for. So by setting a delay of 150 milliseconds, what that means is that the radio will not play the soundtrack associated with this middle position until that switch has been there for 150 milliseconds. So that way, if I'm just passing through from say high to low, I don't get two audio prompts, I just get the one at the bottom position. Next up is USB mode, and this refers to what you want the radio to do when you connect the computer to the radio via USB cable. In my case, I have it set to ask because sometimes I want it to be a joystick, sometimes I want it to read the SD card contents, and sometimes I might want to flash my internal module. So I have mine set to ask, but you can specify what you want it to do as well. Click on the jog dial and scroll to the right and joystick, J-O-Y-S-T, means that whenever you connect it to the computer, it will act like a joystick. You can set it to SD card. Anytime you connect it to a computer in this mode, it'll act like a great big thumb drive and you can access your SD card contents. And then if you put it on serial, that will let you do things like flash internal modules. I have mine set to ask because I want the radio to ask me every time I plug it in. Default channel order, this is up to you. The only thing this is applicable for is when you initially set up a model. When you create a model on Edge TX, it will lay out your mixes for you in this order. You are free to change that mix order if you want. You don't have to keep them there. It just has to know, okay, if you predominantly fly AETR and you create a new model, we'll just go ahead and lay your mixer out the way you normally do it. That's all that means. That's all that means. You can change any of this stuff in the mixer configuration at will. So it's just, this only refers to the initial mixer configuration. That's it. The rotary encoder mode on this radio is set to normal. There are a couple of options. So if you want to invert it, what that does is it reverses the direction that the rotary encoder works. So now when I go to the right, it's actually moving the cursor up. And if I go back down to the rotary encoder and put it on normal, now when I go to the right, it goes down. So that's all that means. And then there's a couple of other options for screens that are oriented a little bit differently. The V and the H stand for vertical and horizontal. In this case, vertical is inverted and horizontal is normal. And then in this case, vertical is inverted and horizontal is alternative. That's not very intuitive. I kind of hope the Edge TX developers do a little better job explaining that but that's what we have. Those are the options. In my case, I'm going to leave mine on normal because changing it would completely mess up my navigation on my radios. And the last option on the bottom is mode. In my case, I'm a mode two flyer. So my left stick controls the rudder and the throttle and my right stick controls the elevator and the ailerons. If you want to change your mode, you can highlight the number, press on the jog dial and switch to mode one. That would make your left stick rudder and elevator and your right stick throttle and aileron. I don't know who'd want to fly that way. That seems crazy to me. I'm going to leave mine on mode two where it belongs. You can also choose mode three and mode four if you want. All right, that's the radio setup page. We're rounding third and heading for home.
Next up are global functions. Global functions are an awesome feature on Edge TX, but before I tell you about them, I have to give you a caveat. Not every single special function that's available in a model is available in global functions. Trust me when I tell you the developers have put a lot of thought into that. One of the big ones I get is can I just do an override channel in global functions so I can set up one throttle lock and that's it? And the answer is no. They don't allow an override channel feature in global functions. You have to do that in special functions. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let me explain what global functions can do for you. In my case, I like my high and low rates on a single switch. I always put it on this SB switch right here. So what I do is set up a global function that says when the SB switch is in the up position, so when it's all the way up, play the track rate high. And then when it's not in the up position, that's what that little exclamation is there. It says exclamation SB up. That means when the SB switch is not in the up position, I want you to play rate low. So now when I move my SB switch to the middle or down position, it plays the track low rate. The last option in here is an exclamation dash, and all that means is don't play it during startup. So when I turn the radio on, I don't want it to call out my switch positions. So in that case, we use the exclamation dash. If I put it on dash, it's not enabled at all. And if I put it on one, two, or three, that refers to how often that value is repeated. So if I leave it on two, this value will be repeated every two seconds. So I'll go ahead and click enter there and we'll put it in high rates, high rate. High rate. High rate, high rate, high rate. You get it? So that's how often it repeats. I'm gonna change it back to the way I had it, which is don't play it on startup, but play it once whenever it's activated after that. Another one of my favorite features of Edge TX is the instant trim function. I have mine set with SF down. SF is a momentary switch right here. So when I press that button, I get an instant trim and that's a global function. So for every model I have, if I'm using trim, all I have to do to instant trim is press SF down. To round out my global functions, we'll talk a little bit about backlight and volume. When I talked about the backlight feature, I told you that I had it set on a potentiometer up top. So S2, that's the pot right here on the right-hand side. That's how I can control my backlight. And then on the left-hand side, pot one, I can turn my volume up and down. Notice how it says VOL there though, and not S1. I'll show you that in just a minute. So to make these work, you simply set up a global function with the switch of on. And the reason you do that is because whenever the radio is on, you want this to be in effect. So that's the switch. There's no switch to turn this feature on and off. So in my case, with that on, I can set my backlight with S2 and I have it enabled. And on the next row, I have on again and I control the volume with my volume pot. And I'll show you how to label that in just a moment. And that's also enabled. Next up is the trainer page. When it comes to using the radio as a trainer, you have to think about these sticks coming from another radio. So in this case, aileron right here, there's, there's information coming from a student radio. So we have to tell the radio how to interact with the data we're getting from the student. Now you've got these really odd looking icons. What this colon equals means is that when we have the trainer mode turned on and we're taking data from the student, we wanna replace the value on the sticks with whatever the student is sending. If we change this to be plus equals, what that does is combines the value from the instructor sticks and the student sticks. Or if you set it to off, that means it ignores values from the student. So let's say for example, you're trying to teach a student how to fly and you just want them to learn how to use the elevator. You can come in and turn the aileron off and the throttle off and the rudder off. And what this configuration means is the student will only be able to send information from the elevator access on their radio through to yours. The middle column refers to the weight or amount of travel coming from the student radio that will be sent to the output on the master. So you can reduce the student's throws just by reducing this value. And then in the final column under source, you can map the student's channels to the appropriate sticks on your radio. So if you, for example, have a mode one student and you're a mode two flyer, you can rearrange the mapping. So when they send the throttle on the right hand side, you can remap that to the throttle stick on your mode two radio, which would be over here on the left hand side. The multiplier field down at the bottom simply acts as a multiplier for all weights simultaneously. So if you want to reduce all weights at one time, say to 90%, you can just click on this field and bring it down to 0.9 or say 80% at 0.8. Or if the student doesn't have enough throw, you can increase them to something a little bit higher. So if you want them to be 110%, you can set your multiplier at 1.1. 1 .1. 
And the calibration field at the bottom allows you to calibrate the student center to your center. So have a student release their sticks and then hit the calibrate button and everything should be zero with no movement coming in from the student's radio. The next page is the hardware page, and the first option is sticks calibration. And when you first get a Radio Master Boxer, this is one of the first things that you should do. Uh, press enter to start, set the sticks midpoint, and I also do pots at their midpoint. So I'll set here everything middle, the six position in the middle, the sticks in the middle. And then once everything is set at the middle, we'll press enter. And now it says to move the sticks and pots to their full deployment. So I'll do that full travel on the sticks left and right, up and down, we'll move the pots up and down and we'll also go through the six position switch and make sure we go through all six positions there. And then we press enter when we're done, that's calibration. We do that to let the radio get calibrated to the analog interface coming from the pots and the sticks. Next up, you'll notice that we've got rudder, elevator, throttle, and aileron. And the idea behind these fields is where you can actually assign a label. So remember when we talked about my volume control, that's how I did it. I went into the hardware page and I found my S1 pot and I gave it a label of volume, V-O-L. Now, anytime in my configuration, S1 will no longer be referred to as S1. It, instead, it'll be referred to as volume. The next field also defines what type of control S1 is. So if I wanted to change that, I could say, well, it's not a potentiometer. There's a pot with a detent. I think I'll leave it on there. That sounds good. Not sure what the difference is between those two, but I'm gonna go ahead and set them both to pot with detent. I kinda like that. S3 is actually a reference to this six position switch. So I gave mine a label of 6P and the switch type is labeled as multi-position. And then finally in the switches section, you can configure how the hardware switches behave as well. So in my case, SA is a two position switch, SB is a three position switch. So those things are defined in the switch section. And of course you can provide labels for these switches as well. Next up is battery calibration. And what this field shows you is how the radio sees the voltage level on your battery. What you really wanna do here is connect a voltmeter to your battery so you can get a reading on a voltmeter that you trust and then marry this calibration value up to what your voltmeter is showing. So for example, if your voltmeter was showing you 6.38, you'd simply click on this field and run it up to 6.38. If it's showing you 6.34, you use the jog dial and go down to 6.34. It's just there to calibrate the radio to the actual voltage being put out by the battery. The RTC battery is a reference to the voltage for the little watch style battery that's on the motherboard that helps remember certain settings like your time and date, for example. The check RTC option simply validates the RTC battery voltage to ensure it's sufficient level to maintain the things that it needs to remember. Next up under internal RF, you can set your internal module to the type of module in the radio. In my case, it's Express LRS, so I have it set to CRSF. You could also set it to multi if you have a multi protocol module. And for baud rate, basically anything over about 400K should be sufficient for Express LRS. I know for F1000, you need a 400K baud rate or higher. I'm at 921, so I should be fine there. Under sample mode, I have mine set to normal. The other option is one bit. And for one bit, you only really use that if you're using an X9D plus or X7 radio. So if you don't have one of those, just go ahead and leave this on normal. That's all you need to do. For serial port, I have aux one highlighted, and these are ports that can be addressed on the box or within the radio. The first option is telemetry mirror, which allows you to take anything going to the external module bay and send it out via the serial port. For telemetry in, that allows you to receive telemetry inbound from the serial port. S-Bus Trainer allows you to connect an S-Bus receiver to the aux port, and that allows you to bind an S-Bus transmitter to the S-Bus receiver and use any S-Bus transmitter as a student radio using the trainer subsystem. The next option is Lua, which allows you to send and receive data to and from Lua scripts. In my case, I have nothing connected to the aux port, so I'll just leave it turned off. Finally, for USB VCP, I've personally never tried this one, but my understanding is you can send commands to the radio via command line when this is enabled. So that would be over a virtual COM port connected via the USB port on top of the radio. Next up is the ADC filter, which stands for Analog to Digital Converter Filter. The bottom line here is that when you're using an analog interface like a joystick, this motion has to be converted into digital somewhere along the line. The ADC filter is meant to filter out small variations in that analog conversion process. So you can turn it on or off. Normally you would leave this on if you're connected directly to servos and you'd normally leave it off if you're connected to something like a flight controller, like a beta flight or INAV flight controller, you'd normally turn that off. You can also turn this on and off on a per model basis as well. 
This RAS field is a reference to the reflected antenna signal or formerly SWR. Not all radio protocols support it. I don't even have a receiver bound on this one, so I don't see any data there. But if your radio protocol does support SWR, now RAS or reflected antenna signal, you should see those values show up here. Under debug, we have options analog and keys. And the main thing you're looking for in here is the ability to make sure that when you move a stick, you see it register on the radio. That's one way to prove that your hardware is actually working and being registered by the radio. And then when you click on keys, you have the ability to move your switches up and down and you can validate that you see the correct movement for the switches that you're touching. So for SB, right now I've got it in the middle position. Now it's in the up position and now it's in the down position. This page simply validates that the radio sees the correct position of the toggle switch. You also have the ability to validate your navigation buttons. So as I move the jog dial, I can see movement on this indicator down here. If I press down, I see exit highlighted. If I press page right, the page button is highlighted. Page left, this button is highlighted. Although it does look to me like these labels are a little bit misaligned. I'm hitting page left, not enter. So that should to me say page left or page right. So when I hit the return button, I would expect that to illuminate exit, not menu, which is what it does. And the final page is really just an information page. This shows you what version of Edge TX you're running. In my case, I'm running the latest as available in late April, 2023. This is version 2.9. It is a nightly build. And when you click on firmware options down here at the bottom, you can see the options with which this firmware was compiled. And when you click on modules or RX version, it should give you information about the modules you're running. In my case, I'm running Express LRS internal. And even though it's turned on, it says here the module is off. So I think that's probably another area that they need to do a little bit of work. But generally speaking, you should be able to get firmware version information out of your modules on this page. And that's it. We've now covered every single option on the Radio Master Boxer Edge TX 2.9 setup for the radio. We didn't go through any model settings. This was simply the radio setup itself. I hope you liked the video, and if you did, please smash that thumbs up button, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you know when new videos hit the channel. YouTube should recommend another video for you right about now. That's all I've got for today. Take it easy, and get out there and fly something.